Greetings, this is Professor Lazarus. Welcome again. And in this lecture, I will be talking to you about horizontal analysis and vertical analysis. So let's get right into the examples. We'll talk about the horizontal analysis first. The horizontal analysis can be conducted on any category in the balance sheet as well as any category on the income statement. Uh, to illustrate, I have selected cash as a balance sheet category to conduct a horizontal analysis. First of all, you would need two years of information. In this example, I have the cash balance at $10,000 for the year 2011 and $12,000 for the year 2012. So given this information, step one would be to calculate the increase or decrease in your cash from 2011 to 2012. That increase in this example works up to $2,000. Step two is to express this increase of $2,000 as a percentage of the old year, the base year. We've done that here. So $2,000 expressed as a percentage of $10,000 is 20%. So our cash has increased by 20% from 2011 to 2012. To fully appreciate this number, we should be doing the horizontal analysis in each successive year. When we do that, what happens is we are converting the increases and decreases to a percentage. And when we do this, it helps the analyst to be able to compare companies of different sizes. If we did not express everything in terms of percentages, then larger companies tend to have a larger fluctuation in terms of increases or decreases. So percentages helps us to eliminate size considerations and makes it much more comparable in terms of larger and smaller companies uh, and, and also helps us with our, what we call our trend analysis when you're looking at these increases and decreases over a period of time. Next, let's look at the income statement and I've selected sales randomly as a category to conduct our analysis. And again, in 2011, our sales was $100,000. 2012, our sales was 105. Step one again is to calculate the increase or decrease. In this case, we have an increase of $5,000. Step two is to express this increase as a percentage of the base year. So $5,000 as a percentage of 100,000 is 5%. So our sales has increased by 5%. So this is a brief example of the horizontal analysis on the balance sheet as well as on an item on the income statement. But regardless of whether it's a balance sheet or income statement, you can see we followed the same two steps. Step one again, calculate the increase or decrease from the base year to the current year. And step two was to express that increase or decrease as a percentage of the old year, the base year. Next, we are going to go into the vertical analysis. And again, like your horizontal analysis, your vertical analysis can be conducted both on the balance sheet as well as the income statement. Here I've illustrated one of each. So on the balance sheet, I've selected cash as the item to conduct the vertical analysis. Now keep this in mind. With the vertical analysis, we're going up and down, hence the word vertical. So we are only looking at one year at a time, unlike your horizontal analysis where you were going across two years. So in this case, cash 2011 was $10,000. Now for the horizontal analysis, you have to select a base category. Your base category can be total assets, if it's a balance sheet, or it can also be your total liabilities and equity combined. Because if you recall from the accounting equation, assets is equal to liabilities and equity. So whether you select your total assets as your base or total liabilities and equity combined as your base, it's the same mathematical number. So in this case, we are going to take the cash balance of 10,000 and express it as a percentage of the base number, which is our total assets of 200,000 and that works up to 5%. So similarly, you can take any item on the balance sheet, accounts receivable or inventory for this year and express it as a percentage of your total assets. Or you can take a liability account like accounts payable and express that as a percentage of your total liabilities and equity combined, which again would be the same number. Next, let's look at an income statement item to illustrate the vertical analysis. I have selected cost of goods as the item here, as a category to do the analysis. And again, like the balance sheet, we need a base 
account. Usually on the income statement, your base account tends to be sales or sales revenue. So in this example, we have cost of goods sold in 2011 of 40,000 and we have sales revenue of 100,000. So 40,000 expressed as a percentage of the sales revenue would be 40%. Similarly, you can take any other item on the income statement and express it as a percentage of the sales revenue. So for instance, you could have rent expense as a percentage of the sales revenue, or you could have salaries expressed as a percentage of the sales revenue and so on. Again, you can take any item on the income statement and express that as a percentage of your base, which in this case is the sales revenue. And typically in an income statement, the sales revenue would be your base. Now to further help us interpret some of this data in terms of the real world, let me give you an example. I've changed some of the numbers slightly, but not too much. Let me give you an example that I have from one of my clients uh, in the past where this client owned two crab houses. I'm calling them crab house number one and crab house number two. Crab house number one, cost of goods sold was 200,000 and their sales revenue was 500,000. So your cost of goods sold was 40% of your revenues. And crab house number two was larger, almost double the size, $1 million in sales. Cost of goods sold was 600,000. So here the cost of goods sold was 60%. My question is, why is there a difference in the cost of goods sold? Now let me give you some additional information to help you think through this question. Both restaurants had identical menus, which meant they were serving the same items and the selling prices of the menu items were identical in both restaurants. Furthermore, both restaurants bought their food and beverages from the same suppliers and it cost them the same. So their food costs and beverage costs were the same, same suppliers. Their menu was identical, both in terms of the items as well as in terms of the pricing. Yet we find that the larger crab house had a 60% cost of goods sold, the smaller one had a 40%. Now, the Think, while you're thinking through this, remember, don't think in terms of the rent or salaries or any of those things because they don't factor into the cost of goods sold. Typically, what factors into a cost of goods sold for a restaurant would be your food and beverage costs. If they serve alcohol, then it would include alcohol as well. So these are the only categories that make up cost of goods sold for a restaurant typically, food, beverage, and alcohol if they're serving alcohol. So the fact that this restaurant may have more employees working, may have a higher salary cost, the fact that the larger restaurant may have more rent, those things will not factor into your cost of goods sold. Yet, interestingly, the cost of goods sold for the larger restaurant was much higher. So we went back and looked at uh, what would be some possible reasons. Usually when you're confronted with a scenario like this, there are two main possibilities. One would be theft. When there's theft of food involved, Think about it, that the food when it's stolen by your employees is no longer part of your inventory so it becomes part of your cost of goods sold. But there's no offsetting revenues coming into you. So your cost of goods sold number keeps going up but this revenue number does not go up because you're not getting any revenues for that. Okay? So that was in this case that held true that there was a lot of theft going on. What we did was we found out over a period of time that one of the employees would throw the trash, this was a large restaurant, so they had a big dumpster at the edge of the parking lot. So this one employee would throw out the trash and then, to make a long story short, right after she threw the trash, a guy would pull up in a pickup truck, climb into the dumpster, and then take out the trash bag, put it in his, dump, put it in his truck, and drive away. When he was finally intercepted one day, well, you guessed it, there was no trash in the trash bag, but a lot of frozen crab cakes, expensive items. So that was her way of stealing, was taking out the crab cakes in the trash bags and then getting it out uh, in that manner. Another factor, while we were analyzing and investigating these differences, another factor we found out that caused this cost of goods sold percentage to be high was the owner's two sons. This large restaurant had two bars, upstairs and downstairs. And typically speaking, most bars, the bartenders use a stopper in the liquor bottle. What does a stopper do? A stopper regulates the volume of alcohol that goes into each glass. It, it, it measures 
the amount of alcohol that goes into each class. And what the owner's sons were doing was, they would remove the stoppers, oftentimes when they serve as bartenders, especially when their friends came along, and they would pour alcohol into somebody's glass without the benefit of the stopper. So if you stop and think from an accounting standpoint, if you remove the stopper and poured alcohol directly from the bottle into the glass, let's assume that instead of one unit of alcohol, maybe two units of alcohol went into that glass. And if two units of alcohol went into the glass, the owner's sons did not charge their friends double. So what happened was you had two units of cost in terms of alcohol going into one glass, but only one unit of revenue coming in. So that caused, again, your cost of goods sold to increase uh, much higher in relation to your revenues. Whereas well, didn't have the problem here in the smaller crab house because that was run by a professional manager and he knew how to run that place efficiently. Coming back to the owner's sons, in addition to removing the stopper, sometimes the owner's sons would not charge their friends at all. So in that case, it was a, what I call a double whammy, where two units of alcohol went into a glass and there was zero revenues coming in. So that drastically increased the cost of goods sold in relation to the revenues. So all of these factors contributed to a much higher cost of goods sold in, in this restaurant of Crab House number two in relation to Crab House number one. Now from a profitability standpoint, think about this. If this restaurant was run as well as the first one, the cost of goods sold then would drop down from 60% to 40%. If the owner, my client, could succeed in getting his sons to manage or get an outside manager to run this place more efficiently like the first crab house, a 20% drop on a million dollars of sales, that would mean that my client would have an additional $200,000 in his pocket without increasing sales by even a single dollar. That's how powerful these numbers are. It helps us analyze, it doesn't tell us exactly what the problem is, but it helps us accountants tell our clients that they have a problem. This is a red flag when these percentages are so high. And then it's up to the client to investigate. And, and you can help the client in giving him some possible solutions. But ultimately the client will have to undertake investigations to determine specific, what are the specific reasons causing, in this case, the COGS to be much higher than uh, Crab House number one. So again, I wanted to share this information with you to show you that we accountants use this information in very meaningful ways with our clients. So this, while in a classroom setting it may be a bunch of calculations, they do have a lot of value. So please keep these points in mind as, we, as you review your horizontal analysis and vertical analysis. So that pretty much wraps up our discussion on these analyses. And with that, this is Professor Lazarus signing off. And as I always like to say, accountants work their assets off. Thank you.